You an architect too? Yeah. We heard. Um, I think I can read the introduction. Why don't we do that? That Dean Aldo, I'm going to do the introduction with your camera. Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Romaldo Gergola. Romaldo Gergola is a distinguished architect and teacher, the one-time chairman of Columbia University's Department of Architecture, a widely admired designer of commercial and residential buildings, schools, libraries, and governmental centers, he is the recipient of Architecture's Highest Awards. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Jergala. Why don't we begin at your beginning? You were born in Rome, a city noted for its architectural splendor. How much of an influence was that early environment on you? Well, I don't think that anyone could uh, pass the influence of Rome even if uh, one is not born there, uh, Rome leaves in everyone a good or bad experience anyhow. Very strong in character. I believe that it left in me a, a, an experience that goes back to consider architecture as a, in terms of the link with the past to a great extent. Uh, to to certain fundamental value that architecture has, and I'm convinced that it has to be approached with. Uh, and overall, to the old spirit that uh, the making of an environment could be made through manufactured element and could be just as human, as natural, as could be conceived. You have many links to the past, including one very close to home. Your father was a Beaux-Arts architect himself. How did his work or his ideas influence your own architectural philosophy? My father had, uh, in a way, the fortune of doing very few buildings and uh, concentrating very much in few clients. He was living uh, in a small town before coming to Rome. and. Uh, and he built uh, for his friend uh, four or five buildings along a street. And to him, it seems that he already covered the whole world of experience in architecture. And I thought that when I compare with what we have to do, <laughs> I found that uh, those precise and fundamental experience was a great uh, teaching value for me. By what architectural periods or styles have you been most influenced? That's difficult to say, really, because I, I cannot uh, take uh, uh, an influence from a particular style. I think all the style, in a way, influence uh, my thinking in architecture. I may have an inclination, a, a, a preference of some type of architecture. I, I think that the, if you want to call the style of the architecture of the Renaissance is the one that I feel more interested with and more enthusiastic about, emotionally connected to. For what particular reason? I think because the Renaissance developed a confluence into architecture of a great number of, of elements, uh, the pleasure of living, the, the notion of places where people were working, the relationship between the building and the city, the, uh, the attitude toward the landscape and the natural environment, all those factors you found there in that precise language that evolve also through an historical connection. Because as you know, the Renaissance 
has strong roots into the past, the Roman architecture and, and the architecture of Greece. So that, for that, I think I feel mostly sympathetic to that kind of atti at attitude, I think. What do you think made the greatest architecture of the Renaissance possible? I think that that very much uh, come from the fact that the architect of the Renaissance were concerned or a changing situation in life. They had to deal with new program of life. And they tried directly to respond to them. They used language that uh, in, par in part they, they developed by looking at what existed before. In other words, their architecture had the true resonance, what we call, that is the ability to link with another time so that th there is a continuity. There is not a breach with the past. Um, and, uh, but especially the fact that they were able to really appreciate the changing world in which they were living. I don't think that uh, the Dome of Florence, which is considered in a way the first building of the Renaissance would have been possible without that sort of breakthrough of considering all of a sudden the, the church as a community place where you have to have a big space for a great meeting. So was that engendered by the church or by the people? No, or it was by the architects? It was engendered by the people. In other words, by the, the, the sort of uh, dynamic of life that uh, change the nature of the assembly, the freedom of, of exchange that took place in the Renaissance, this terrific uh, uh, um, osmosis that occurred in the society at that time, produced these new spaces, new characteristic of space and so on, to which the architect responded. Brunelleschi, which is considered the first architect of the Renaissance in many ways, uh, really worked very hard with the various committee that were building the, the church or the cathedral or this place, this public place really, uh, work uh, for years and years to, with the masons, with everybody involved, and was a, not at all a sort of dictator of forms as one would imagine to uh, was interpreted later on by, in particular by the Beaux-Arts uh, professors. was really a man that was working in the field directly with the workers and, uh, and responding to the need of, of society in that particular moment. To your way of thinking, does the contribution of the people still play a significant role in the design of the built environment? Uh, maybe I'm uh, not so popular in that, but I, I definitely think so. I think society is the real uh, motor of any kind of new architectural idea. An architect alone, uh, you can see from the house that he built for himself, they are usually a uh, pretty awful thing. Uh, that because they, an architect without a client really is a non-entity. Architecture is all made, is the really is, as I mentioned before, is the confluence of the, a tremendous number of factors, plus the contribution to it of, of a great number of people. That's a very humanist view. I suspect that some clients, vis-a-vis -vis their architects, sometimes feel like non-entities, to use your phrase. It may be possible, yes. But uh, what uh, really think that uh, an architecture without, uh, 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 architecture, architecture doesn't have uh, an audience, has only participant really, well, because it belongs to everyone. I mean, it is a peculiar art in that sense. It's an art with very peculiar connotation, let's say. Well, we will we are aware of the fact that architecture is an inescapable art, but don't you think, or do you think, that very often that one part of that formula, one part of that participatory process, <coughs> excuse me, that one part of that participatory process frequently feels 
that they are outside of the process, the recipient rather than the collaborator in the design of the very buildings that they live in and work in and play in. Now this is unfortunate because and in fact, uh, in my way of attacking the problem, uh, I try since the very beginning to bring into the uh, making, really, of architecture as many people as possible. I do that in the office by bringing different talent into it, uh, not necessarily architect or young architect or technician and so forth, but people also from, from different field. For example? Uh, oh, I have people from uh, uh, archaeology and, and uh, um, um, uh, technology in, par in particular, but uh, people that come from, from different areas of, of endeavors, uh, literature, and that help very much in... Well, for example, what does someone who's involved or trained in literature contribute to the work of the office of an architect? I think uh, contribute in producing especially a critical evaluation of the various kind of ideas and, and motion that occur within a project. Uh, we found that very uh, helpful in the very beginning to have outside people uh, contribute to that. And the kind of criticism that comes emerge out of it is is very spontaneous, is not uh, articulated by intellectual preconception, and, and is very helpful in that sense, I think. To pursue your idea of architects being responsive to the needs of the people, I wonder if you can tell us what kind of spaces the people need or want or demand currently. Yes, I would like to be precise. More than the need, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, thinking of the aspiration of people. See, needs uh, really never produce anything great. I mean, you answer to a need and you satisfy the momentary situation. I think really architecture is involved with aspirations, and those are the things that, that you have to search for. People has aspiration of various sort, and, and a great variety of it. Sometimes be, they become group aspiration and so on. But those are the things to identify in order really to arrive to, uh, to the development of form, to the understanding of space and so on. It's out of pure needs comes up the resolution of functional problem. And that is you know, something that anybody almost can do. In fact, in this country, there are anyone is very experienced in that. I, I never, is, in Europe it's quite different. Uh, nobody knows how to even adjust a faucet in the bathroom, but uh, here everybody knows how to build a house. So really, <laughs> uh, as far as need, there is no, no really, you don't need an architect for that. You need probably engineers. And we can do that too, but... For what do we need an architect? I think for, to respond to vague aspiration, latent aspiration that are in the body of society or in, in individuals as such. And speaking of need, whatever prompted you to come to New York, I guess, more than 30 years ago? Oh, well, it's a mixture of, uh, of uh, chances and, uh, and situation that develop. I was asked to come to teach at the University of Pennsylvania with Home Perkins and Louis Kahn and, and the... Didn't you come fact, here as a student first? No, I was here, as, yes, with a scholarship, and then I went back to Italy. You came first then as a Fulbright as Fellow? As a Fulbright Fellow, yes. In the early at, 1950s? Correct, in 51. And then uh, I went back to Italy and I came back in 1954. I knew also that uh, uh, Louis Kahn was teaching at Penn, so I was quite interested to, to have that proximity, let's say. What was your first trip like to this country, and what kind of impression did it make on you? Oh, uh, I, the first thing that shocked me when I arrived uh, at, with the boat was a huge advertising that was in the uh, 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 River Drive there, 
um, the and it was uh, Brenda, you didn't fix your refrigerator or something like that, or the uh, a huge uh, advertising of that sort that obliterated all the architecture of the place. I mean, that was unthinkable from Europe, coming from Europe to, to see something that takes three or four blocks as a frontage. So immediately introduced the country in a very picturesque way, <laughs> but also in a very formidable way in terms of, of the a dynamic of responding to, to the instance of life and things as they emerge from a certain situation and and be ready there at the minute to give an answer. Did that, you see uh, that as a challenge or an opportunity? I, I certainly did. and uh, But I thought also when I I became more acquainted with the place that uh, not necessarily this country is this is this place where, where things get used and disposed and consumed very rapidly. There is a, an urge and a desire and an aspiration toward fundamental aspect, toward the, 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 the assessment really of what are the fundamental aspects of life throughout the history. I mean, uh, yes, we live still with the heritage of the laissez-faire or the great initiative of the end of the century and so on, and we're still working around that uh, period of time. But there have been period before uh, in which there was a great conviction in the building of the country, and, and I'm referring to the uh, to history, to the time of the foundation of the country and so on. And where really there was an assessment of the value of the land, the relationship of man and, na and, and nature, and literature, literature was rich of this kind of reference, and yet developing to uh, more intellectual and abstract uh, character. Uh, so it's not, it's not it seems not proper to take always this country as a, a place of perennial disposal of things, of fashion that goes up and down and so on. The, the, the characteristic of looking into a fundamental aspect of life is, is uh, present throughout. And that has to be assessed in order to make architecture, because I think uh, it's essential that uh, that uh, one looks at that in order to make architecture develop from fundamental issue and not from superficial one. You mentioned when you returned to America, you went to Philadelphia and worked with several architects, including the distinguished architect Louis Kahn. Did you tell us, do you feel you learned from his work? Was his most important contribution that of a teacher, a theorist, or an architect? Uh, to answer to the first uh, question, I believe that um, I use this word fundamental many times, and uh, it comes very much from uh, his teaching and from his uh, uh, attitude to things, to life in general, and to architecture. Uh, the, I think, in terms of the second question, is that uh, he excelled in all three uh, um, aspects that you mentioned. He was a tremendous teacher and a tremendous architect. Uh, I think still has to be discovered as an architect. has been too much, too quickly associated by critics to Beaux-Arts and uh, those periods only because he was not biased to Beaux-Arts. But he went beyond, beyond that in, in many ways in his thinking and his, uh, and his doing as an artist, really. And what manifestation uh, leads you to that conclusion that he went beyond that? To a great extent, the fact that, again, he was concerned of, of taking architecture as a response to instance of life, to new situation in life. 
He was always searching the nature of things, why certain things are in a certain way, what they mean as an association, a monastery or a, or a convention hall, what happened really in order to start, what kind of space they developed, and uh, what kind of fundamental uh, shapes and, and form really are, 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 are causing and how this particular kind of, of, uh, of uh, space that they determine become in turn evocative of the, the particular action that takes place in that, in that uh, space. Uh, room was the word that he used all the time. He was thinking in terms of rooms. Architecture is an, uh, an assembly or an association of rooms. And that was a tremendous revolution in architecture, because if you think that before everybody was talking of floating space or, or things that were compenetrated, the famous uh, ranch house, the split level and so on, there was no place to hang. In fact, one of the characteristics of the American house where there was no place where to sit, because everything was <laughs> mixed into another space. and. Uh, and this coming back, or rather the insisting upon the value of the room as, as, a, the, as a primordial element of architecture, was uh, really a tremendous breakthrough, because from there came always a, a host of architects that thinks in the same way, they take that as a point of departure, and I'm doing myself too, hopefully, but of course, everybody evolved in a different way. Do you see your architecture coming from cons as a point of departure? Do you see your work in some ways being an extension or a continuation of the ideas expressed in his buildings? Well, that would be too ambition, ambitious for me to say. Only I can say that I learn a lot from, uh, from uh, I hope that I learn a lot from uh, his saying and, and uh, and I hope that he, think, he would think that this is uh, a, a good following. <laughs> How do you think he would have thought about some of the recent developments in architecture? I think he would be very disconcerned about some of the development, mostly because, uh, and he during his lifetime really uh, um, was very adamant against the uh, the circumstantial, what he call, what he used to call, you know, the reliance upon the circumstances, which in, in turn developed the pluralism and, uh, and all what we are witnessing now in architecture. Before we go on, uh, you might describe to us the circumstantial art that he always denounced. What did he mean by that? All the things that uh, were not. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, were accidental, sort of, or incidental in architecture. Um, that a room uh, had, first of all, respond to uh, evoke a spe special condition of quietness, isolation, uh, contemplation, or uh, great gathering for 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 fun and so on. I mean, it, the, all these characteristic were the fundamental one to look at. All the rest, the shape, the color of the fabric, the, 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 the molding of a certain thing to him, were of descriptive value, but were not the thing to start with. Do you share that disapproval? Uh, yeah, I think so. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. Mm. What is Khan's role today? Is he as influential as he was at the time of his death, I guess more than 10 years ago? Yes, I think, uh, I think uh, you will hear talking of him and, and you will hear a turning, rediscover his, his value. When do you expect constantly. that to happen? And what will the catalyst be? I think it will be pretty soon. Uh, we will have to make a great deal of self-assessment. Uh, uh, we are going to a, a not to a, a particularly uh, generous period as far as uh, endowing architecture of thing. 
uh, a great deal of, uh, of merry-go-round took place in last uh, few years, but uh, we have to, m to make a s quite a somber assessment of, of what we can afford to do. And uh, there will be more and more need of, uh, of spaces which, which are designed to respond to aspiration and needs of the public at large, so that uh, uh, lots of places have been deteriorating public place presently, and, uh, and there will be need to move in the future will be toward the direction of, of, uh, of making sounder place to go to school, to learn, to go to work. I think one of, uh, of the great future of architecture for architects is the, is the development of, of working place, place for work, which have never been, see we assume that an office place is okay. But really, uh, is not, there is much to work. If you think about this layer of, of floors with people isolated in the middle of the building, we're spending most of their day without uh, looking outside a window or being air conditioning and, and conditioned all the time, is really not a good environment. And uh, <clears throat> as well as the factory, I mean, for the factory is the same problem. There would be a great movement to develop better place where you spend most of your day. And they have to be approached not from a sort of uh, circumstantial or fashionable standpoint, but by, from a very fundamental one. What you do, how do you relate with other people in that? Well, what functional innovations can you envision in the workplace? There are many. For instance, uh, uh, the desire in the same time of of a certain intimacy and isolation. Uh, you know, for many years one has been working with this open space idea, open floor idea in an interior space. Well, there is a, we can sense very much a, an insistence now to, to look for individual space, individual rooms with window looking outside. Uh, you found that the, uh, pool of working people, which are used to, because of the presence of other electronics and so on, still they have a desire of, of having more contact with the natural environment and so on. So that you will find that those will be creating new forms in architecture, this aspiration in many ways. The, in the working place is the same thing in, in the factories. The notion of teamwork, the much smaller team in relation with the huge uh, employment uh, into a factory and so on, the production of a, of a small team creates smaller place, different kind of uh, workshop and so forth. And again, the contact with nature will be one of the most important thing in the, in the future of architecture, I think. Is that what you mean when you referred to one of the things that you like to see in architecture? And that is the realization of a sense of place? Yes, probably it is, yes, I would say. Well, long before you became the distinguished Mr. Jergala, like other young architects, while waiting for the right building to come along, you were otherwise engaged. And in the very beginning of your career, you didn't even work as an architect, as many architects are forced to do. Can you tell us a little bit about your early working experiences? Well, I, I work uh, in a publishing company. I had to make my New York experience, I suppose. And, uh, and that was the available. I was very free. I lost all the prejudice. If I were in Europe, I would never have done a thing like that. Because Why? In Europe, uh, you, you are born, an, you are an architect, you are most born an architect, and, uh, and there you have to do just that, nothing else. I mean, uh, but I was under the impression, for example, that there were so many architects currently being trained, for example, in Italy, that it was perfectly acceptable, in fact, 
they predictable you, yeah. to become a graphic designer to do interior design not the way some architects trained in this country who until the recent state of the economy might look askance at that kind of employment it's true now uh, in my time it wasn't like that no. no it's much truer now so here you were freed from so these old bonds and what did you do and, and uh, i worked for a publishing company and i was art director of, of a magazine called interiors and then industrial design and uh, so i worked for a few years on that but it was a, a sort of a I was an activity that I enjoyed. I felt very, very... What did you learn from doing that? And what did you learn, too, that in any way influenced your later practice of architecture? Oh, I don't know if it uh, influenced the practice of architecture. I don't think so. I, you know, I, in, in fact, I was always uh, having in the back of my mind the fact that I was thinking as an architect in, 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 in contributing to that in some value in some form. But uh, I think, uh, you see, I, I work is always good. Anything uh, in architecture, you, you learn from all sorts of experience, really. And architecture itself is, is work. Uh, it's really hard work in, in a context of art, if you wish. Uh, but it's essentially hard work. Uh, of putting together people, of developing conceptually something, or designing, of drafting, of of uh, of, uh, of making drawings and and uh, uh, sketches, and then go to the field, learn about the material and the method of construction, and and follow up the, the people in the field, talk with the people in the field. Uh, most of my time, last time I was in Australia, it was to spend with the construction manager and all our team leaders and so on, and the field manager, which means, you know, an encompass project like that, uh, go down to learn about why I think really uh, you become responsible in architecture about all sorts of things. And, and, uh, you have to feel responsible, otherwise you are not an architect. I think, you know, there is a great deal of confusion. What you say before about architects that eventually legitimately do some, uh, some other thing is fine, but they are no longer architects. I think they are something else. Uh, like an architect that makes a good conceptual idea and is uh, promoting a certain ideas, but really never touch the mud in the field. I don't think that he has the full spectrum of of uh, of, uh, of the arts of architecture, really, because it's an art that is, to a great extent, uh, um, is like a river, really, which which uh, start from from a spring, very small, but it doesn't become a substance until that there is the confluence of a lot of a lots of other. Um, element and uh, and people into it and then it eventually become this choral effort which one has to appreciate otherwise architecture remain the demonstration of a theory and that is not good you make a theory you make a box and that's the end of it and people have to digest a life that, to which they they sort of submit for lack of anything better they think that the water cooler is enough for progress to make them comfortable, but it's not. And that makes a long range life quite miserable in the country. Architecture is really has to, be, has to come spontaneously from uh, this resolution of opposing forces. That why it's not for architecture to illustrate the contradiction of life but rather the resolution of opposing forces, you see, because not, you know, there are buildings, there are pure architecture which were not designed by architects, you know that. I mean, you found a shelter in the country and you marvel how wonderful, what exciting aesthetic experience you get out of it. And that because really there is a confluence in that point. There is not, a, 
some genius that designed that particular thing. But I appreciate that having a tremendous aesthetic value. And I wish that I can do something like that, you see. So it's, it's really a process for me to become like that anonymous group of people that conceived that kind of shelter at a certain point. Well, to pursue your metaphor, I guess early on you decided to become a part of the mainstream and started your own architectural firm called Mitchell Jurgala. And its very first building received, I guess, nationwide recognition. Before we talk about the Wright Brothers Memorial Visitor Center, oh, yes, oh. why don't you tell us, to begin with, about your firm? To, who is Mr. Mitchell, and how did the two of you come together? Oh, well, we met in Philadelphia, and uh, he was, uh, we, we, actually, we met in an office where he was uh, uh, working for, and, uh, were you both working in the same no, office? No, I, I didn't really work for anyone <laughs> in any office, really. What were you we, doing? Then I was working at school. I mean, we were working together at school, but I never worked in an office of another architect um, here for some strange reason. And, uh, only as a training period in the very beginning, yes, in, in Brooklyn, I remember. Yes, when I was at school at Columbia, as a training period. Of, of, of the school. But, uh, so we met in Philadelphia and we had an opportunity of, uh, uh, of someone, was a, again a period of depression economically and the government was uh, giving, at that time the government was very generous in putting out jobs. <laughs> for, Let's hope that happens again. Well, I hope so. But, um, uh, and we designed the, the Wright Brothers Museum. Well, see, it wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the government, the good intention of the government. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this first project? What were your major concerns there? Well, uh, uh, Kitty Hawk, or, or this place where the Wright Brothers took off, is uh, in the middle of sand dunes and uh, an open field and, and well, it's a difficult place there was nothing really that could make recognizable the place for, from a distance so the problem was to put a shelter for the first uh, kite motorized kite uh, that, as I did and uh, and so we thought at the beginning to make a sort of a gesture from a great distance and the roof of that particular room became a peculiar shape so that from a distance one can see that something different is going on there, uh, like a, a, a signal with an handkerchief and so on. And uh, so that, that was the beginning. And then the space was divided in, in the exhibit proper, the terrace where people would look at the field and, and a small museum. It was a very small building, but uh, very firm, contrasting this sort of shifting environment of the sand dunes and so forth. By the way, who did what in that project? How did you and Mr. Mitchell divide or share your duties? And how do you do that now? Well, we still work in the same way, really. We, we are sort of complementing each other. He has a more administrative and, uh, and technical talent and uh, and so I I think I found a great deal of, of help in, and in the collaboration and uh, in that sense every architect uh, wants criticism all the time and and uh, and the best help really is the criticism of somebody in a different, also in a different field, or in which, which is interested in different kind of aspect of architecture. Your perspective, I guess, from the very beginning has been a very large one. More than 20 years ago, you wrote in the Yale Architectural Journal, Perspecta, an essay that was entitled, The Realism of the Partial Vision. Won't you give us some idea 
of what some of those ideas in that essay were, and are they still central to your work? Oh, well, 20 years ago. But I, I, yes, I think that they still are. What that means to me is that I don't think of architecture at the beginning as a whole. I don't think our way of life and our attitude to life really allowed us to conceive, to preconceive form, uh, absolute form in which then we sort of make, make people fill this space inside. We rather think in terms of parts, of element, parts that we can bring to scale with people, Pe pa parts that are friendly, that you can be starting from a door, a, the entry, a threshold, and so on, things that you can touch, that you can relate as a dimension, and move from there. In other words, I think you have to study very well the parts. If you, if you really think of the architecture of, of the Renaissance was born in that way. Before Brunelleschi arrived to the hall of uh, St. Lawrence, he was very much concerned of the single element, the single arcade of the nave as a unit that he studied perfectly in proportion, in the term of calibration of the size of the column, the capital, the dimension of the arch, and so on. And once that that element was clearly established, then it became, it became part of an aspiration to the whole. You see, I feel always that the whole is something that is something to, to work toward. It's something that... Uh, so you still feel that the building is a fragment of the larger whole absolutely. and not an object that is complete unto right, itself. Right, and this is true in terms of, of architecture in the city in particular. Our buildings really are a fragment of, of a variety of instances that exist in the city, as well as in nature. I think one of the great tasks of architect in the future is the one of finding again that wonderful symmetry between uh, the element of nature and the man-made element that the Greek achieved, for instance, in their architecture, in their positioning and of architecture in the space, in the uh, uh, choice of, of land, of positioning of building, and character of, of growth of element, and so on, scale of element, and so forth. Then what is the function of a place in the city, particularly in a city of monumental scale? Well, you see, what the way is this, the program uh, are today developed within a city, most of them are never self-sufficient. Uh, they are, in, an auditorium like this one could serve a different fun function, one day for the uh, new school, another day maybe for another kind of organization and so forth. And there is a, a, a continuous change of this situation throughout the city. And you see more in the in office building which developed this tremendous atrium, for instance, in terms of, of offering something to the city uh, 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 again. And uh, so that uh, all parts, you know, that at the moment, they seem to be dissociated, dissociated, dissociated one from the other, but the task is the one of finding that confluence. Well, what is an idea that you have to make the human element possible in a dense urban center? Well, I think the, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, what, which one would be the form, you mean, that will make the human presence? Uh, I think still, in architecture is the space uh, rather than the uh, uh, taste or uh, but the quality of the space. Uh, uh, a room, for instance, would be how much really we, 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 we have apartment design and so on, but uh, how much more we have to work on that of making place of work rooms where you can isolate yourself, you can develop a certain kind of uh, 
interior life, if you wish, in the moment that you develop that work, so that the work become not something casual and, and something that you have to do because of spending the, the time in a particular way, but become a very intimate thing of your making. And, uh, and that, I think, if I can, uh, if I well understand what you say, I think that the room probably is the form that convey the best and has the potential to exploit all possible human characterization in architecture. Because uh, if I may, moment, uh, see, space always talk to people with the same language that uh, one would talk for the very vital problem. A farmer that goes inside a cathedral, he doesn't care if it is neoclassic or if it is Renaissance or if it is Gothic. What remains in his mind, really, what really will, will be a tremendous sort of emotive experience for him, will be the quality of the space. Either it is something, it provokes something or evokes something to him, or otherwise it's simply a void. I'm, no, I'm not looking in any direction. No. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> so in that sense, uh, this space is, is the fundamental constitu constituent of architecture. Uh, taste is not. Taste uh, could be the description, the circumstantial description of a certain moment. It's too little, really, to rely upon. I mean, it's very important. It's but it's also a predictable convention. Yes, taste arrived is. at at any given uh, point in time. Yes, and uh, and uh, and uh, certainly Sparta is a manifestation of culture. I, I'm not denying that the, a function to taste, but it doesn't have in architecture that role that that sometimes we pretend it to have. For a moment, let's go beyond the room to the building, and the currently prevailing notion that buildings should pay attention to other buildings, that at long last buildings should be well-mannered and fit into the context, an idea that is achieving wider and wider attention. How important to your own work is that consideration? Well, very, very much so, I would think, because, <clears throat> again, uh, I mentioned before the uh, this characteristic of uh, resonance that the building should have. That is, this ability to develop link with the, with the past, which are represented by other form and other building. Uh, I think uh, it's not a matter of question of being a good neighbor, uh, because you could be totally different about uh, as a configuration. But it's, it's a fundamental issue is to establish a, cont a continuity so that uh, is, is an, the, the, the city presents itself as history, as, as a living place, and not as a sort of contest of different kind of thing. I mean, surely New York is quite probably different in that sense. But you see, I never consider New York as an assembly of buildings. It's just one building. And how about Philadelphia? Well, Philadelphia is a little different. Philadelphia has a history of, that still uh, maintains that kind of uh, characterization of parts. And uh, you can still detect that, that narrative into the city. And one should be careful about that. And I think uh, in the few things we did, we tried to be sensitive about that in, uh, in the area of Society Hill and so forth. I bring up uh, Philadelphia because not only have you taught there and worked there, you were also a consultant to the City Planning Commission. You just made reference that you tried to. I wonder if you would describe a very widely published and widely admired building of yours that is very mindful of its context in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. Uh, well, there are few. Uh, uh, I think a recent experience uh, has been the pavilion for the Liberty Bell in uh, the Independence Park. Can you describe that? Uh, it, it, you know, the Liberty were, was located uh, in the, under the tower 
the, of the Independence Hall. And then it was decided to take, uh, during the bicentennial, the bell outside. And the question was first, the location. There was, there is a tremendous number of people lining up all the time to see the bell. Uh, and the first thing that really came to our consideration was really what it represented. And really the bell is a folk story, it's not a monumental experience. We had recommendation that should be an amphitheater with the marine guards in front of it and so on, all sorts of uh, a uh, very uh, strong rhetoric about it. We selected to make something which is really more of a, a gazebo in a park, but to have a very, st so that the bell is located in a special, in some of the building, it developed around a certain location. The most important element was the location of the bell, really, which is related with the tower visually so that you have this sort of discourse, very simple, like you, you know, like a child will do in a many way, to have this contest and this relationship of two elements. And, uh, and we protected it with a roof, glazed around so that people could see also from outside. And, a and especially develop a room around the, the Bell, so that people could have good time and good reminiscence uh, uh, looking at this thing, and they could go close and so forth. And there is a little garden in front of it, so that uh, I, I was quite happy of the experience, and I've been told that people enjoy that experience all the time. And that's the most satisfactory thing for an architect, really, to hear. You feel that order and the significance of order in architecture is really critical to an understanding of your work. Could you elaborate for us on the architectural function of order, especially within urban environments, and what you mean when you make reference, and you do it often, to order? Uh, by order, I think that uh, really not as a preconceived geometrical assessment of things, let's say, but uh, as a sort of sublimation of, a, again, a many aspects of, uh, of, of uh, a certain dynamic of things, of life and use and perception and so forth. And uh, the city developed an order of its own, a kind of body that uh, survive by, by being organized in a certain way. And, uh, and there are, it's difficult to disrupt this, that order. It could only evolve and change. And uh, so I think that when you do a building, you have to be very much concerned of this urban order in one end. You, the same time, by the same token, uh, uh, you have to be concerned of a natural order, of, of a geological order, really, of, in terms of, of the configuration of the land and so on. Sometimes it's very funny to see houses and buildings which were designed for flat land in a sort of a hill, like you find in California all the time, suspended in the air. That's not fun, really. It's really a, a lack of, of of sense of order, of sense of relationship with, with the natural uh, configuration of the land. And, and but it, you see, there is an order of things. Even, even uh, what can I say? Even a, 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 an old part of town, an old part of town has a certain order. If you take Chinatown, it has a certain order of, of its own. A certain fabric that develop, for which if you if you have to build there, you have to be concerned about that order. You cannot do something that is totally against that order. Then what do you mean when you say that you object to the use of an architectural vocabulary that is, that shows, <coughs> excuse me, what do you mean when you say that you object to a vocabulary that is patinaed by time? Uh, I really 
I, by that I mean when one tries to camouflage himself or itself with the, with the environment. Uh, it doesn't mean... Let's use the example of Chinatown. What yeah. would be a desirable well, sense of it, order and to what would you object in that environment? I think uh, the, the sense of order of there is this per particular configuration, let's say of the Chinatown all over the world, this proximity of shops and rhythm of shops open to the street all the time, this depth of shops that you can see inside all the time. And it is not the, 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 the curlicue or the kind of decoration that makes any, any uh, has any impact. But it's that, not the pagoda. Not the pagoda, that's right. But it's this particular order, rhythm of thing, to which all the rhythm of their life is adjusted or is created rather by the rhythm of their life. Those are the things that I think is like in nature. You don't, uh, when you do a building in a natural environment, I mean, you don't do better by using natural wood or or trying to mimetize yourself into, into aspect of nature and so on, or, or, or sort of uh, um, um, digging into it and so forth. No, you can be actually absolutely pristine and independent from that, but the order of thing is very important. If you, the element that built up that particular situation, place, has to be such that respect that order of nature, that the difference between the level, the, 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 the sloping of, of surface, the character of certain surface even, but especially the general configuration are relative to the natural site. Is architecture essentially a person? Is architecture essentially a personal vision or a joint vision shared by the client and the banker and the developer and now even the community? Well, I think it's, uh, I would say that it is a personal vision, but many personal vision. There are different perception of architecture. But who has the last word? Oh, the men that use the place, really. Because what you do it's very strange. When we finish a building, you always feel that uh, something is gone. I mean, people have been asking, do you ever go back to see a building that? And, uh, and when I look, I mean, I, I ask myself, and I say, well, boy, I've been going very few times. Really, I should have gone more. But you feel this sort of detachment. Something is finished. and. Uh, and you have been developing certain instances from some for somebody else